I, I'll give you my email address if you want more information. All right. So we're going to start in with our candidates, and we have uh, the illustrious Jim Lewis here with us for Building Blacks for Liberty, and he's going to, he's not only taping this for us, which is helpful, but he's going to field the questions, and uh, first of all, we, we, we'll, we'll have our candidates say 15 minutes worth of and then after we're done with that, we will um, have a question and answer. So I'll come up there. Okay. Yeah. Come up here. You want to do it afterwards? Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Let me announce uh, that we have uh, Melissa, and I we put on our on our constant contact that went out for everybody yesterday. Their name was Michelle, oh. <laughs> and we spe and we spelled it wrong. So we the last name wrong. So we really apologize for that. Uh, but uh, she's here, and she'd like to start first. We can do that. These are our senatorial candidates, um, two of them, and then we have a tape. We have a tape of Jim Renacci. Let's, let's try it out. Oh, she's gonna stand. You didn't have to tell about spelling my name wrong. I didn't know that you did that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You kept it to yourself. I've had that happen to me. Hey guys, I'm Melissa Ackeson. I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself personally because I think that's the way that folks get to know one another. I'm married to my wonderful husband, Rich, who without him I would not be able to run for office currently. And between both of us, we have four sons, ages 22, 20, 8, and 1. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We're small business owners. We own a surveying and an engineering company. And in that organization, we started it actually out of our living room about 12 years ago. And then we grew the company. So we really understand what it's like to be entrepreneurs. And we made the decision to get out of the private sector and to open up our own businesses because you want the ability to think for yourselves, right? You want the ability to control your own destiny, do your own hiring, and what you quickly figure out not long after opening up your business is you really aren't as free as you think you are. Between the multitude of regulatory, compliance, federal taxes, local taxes, payroll taxes, you name it, you are responsible to so many different people before you can even think about yourselves. And so I started feeling the very real world effects of government encroaching into my life, and that came as a small business owner. Now, if we back up a little bit, I want to tell you where I grew up. Most of you, and I, I realize we had some people who were actually friends with my fifth grade teacher in the room. Um, but I went to Columbus Public Schools, grew up on the west side of Columbus. For those of you who don't know that area, it's an extremely blue collar area. It's a very prideful place. The General Motors plant was on the west side of Columbus that employed many of our parents. Uh, for those parents who didn't work at GM, Parents like my dad, he was a UAW worker, went to school for an apprenticeship program. We didn't really know about formal college education. Um, and he was an employee who made war verbs. They literally made the B-1B, if you remember the B-1 bomber. That was with Rockwell, that was with McDonnell Douglas. So that was really in the heyday of manufacturing. And those are the parents who raised me. I'm the middle child, I bet you, bet you never guessed that. I'm a middle child, I have three sisters, or th there's three of us. And, you know, we just lived a very middle-class, happy life. And I didn't go to formal schooling in terms of a traditional education. In fact, when I was 17 and a half years old, I met with my principal, and I met with the guidance counselor, and I said, listen, um, I know that I'm not going to college, so what I would like to be able to do, and I have a teacher agreeable to doing this, I only need a couple credits to graduate. I'd like to participate in a homeschooling program, and then I want to be able to get a work permit to work 40 hours a week. And so I started working for an organization called Excel Logistics. I was able to still graduate with my high school. I was kind of a pioneer with putting in the homeschooling initiatives, which I believe non-traditional academia is very important to incorporate back into our world again. And that's really how I got my start in life. So I worked in human resources, specialized in that for many years, and then I was recruited by large international organizations where I specialized in a couple different things, but I was a, a union contract negotiator, and that was really one of the first times that I saw a democratic stronghold into the labor and employment market. I literally had employees who were being coached by democratic counterparts telling them, essentially, just negotiate yourselves right out of a job. 
And I had a boss who said, you know, it's really difficult having a union. I want you to go in, more or less wear them down, and we're not going to meet any of their demands. And I thought, I'm not doing that. My dad was a UAW worker. I packed my lunch for months. I sat down with the employees, got to know them, and they trusted me, and they ended up going to the National Labor Relations Board, and they decertified their own <coughs> union that had been around since the 60s. And that's the way that you build trust, and that's the way that relationships are built. Now, some of you know my story from the summer of 2017. As a small business owner, I suffered the very real effects of Obamacare. I was born with an extremely rare bone disease, the entire left side of my face. Is that a timer? The entire, the entire left side of my face is being reconstructed about 22 times with major surgeries. I also have a child who lives with a disability that will be ongoing that we have to manage. So as you can imagine, insurance was critically important to us. Unfortunately for me and what I lived through, it was the $3.3 billion co-ops that all went bankrupt, funded by us, the taxpayer, under Obamacare, clear through the high price, high deductible insurance, and then a year that my business had a break-even year, my family had to go to a welfare office where we were enrolled into Medicaid. So when we talk about Medicaid expansion and we talk about why those things are happening, it's because Medicaid is a more economic advantageous position for people, and folks are intentionally stifling their growth. There is no copay, there is no monthly payment, there is no responsibility at all whatsoever. So when you hear John Kasich and folks talk about Medicaid expansion, Medicaid expansion, I lived through Medicaid and I knew, boy was I a sucker because the years I was spending 40 to 60 grand out of pocket for insurance, my family was better off the year that we were on Medicaid. So no one in their right mind, they're not going to get off of those systems until we start putting parameters in place. I was invited by Vice President Pence to come to the White House to articulate my story in a healthcare listening session. It was on my 39th birthday that I spent with the Vice President, Kellyanne Conway, folks within the administration, and I personally had him deliver cupcakes to me, and I really felt like it was an episode of the Twilight Zone. <laughs> I know, I'm serious, it did. It just felt like, is this really happening to my life that I'm sitting across from Vice President Pence? And after the meeting, I started explaining to him what was happening. And he walked over to my husband and he goes, she knows exactly what's going on. I said, we are living through the starting and ending stages. We are going into socialization. Does anybody see this happening? So the second time I was invited back by President Trump. This time it was to go make a plea to the House, to the Senate. We had a Republican president, isn't that great? And we were actually supposed to be able to deliver some meaningful legislation that could really change the world and we could get rid of everything that had to do with Obamacare. I know we were all excited about that. I was on live TV on Fox Business and I had the mic in front of my face and they said, do you support the skinny repeal? And I just wanted to lose it. I thought, seven years you campaigned, you promised people. Families like mine who have lived through this nightmare, children who have disabilities, people who desperately expected you to act. You lied to the American people. And that's when I recognized the very real world effects of establishment politics. It has nothing at all to do with anything right for the American people. You had the House, you had the Senate, you had the Republican president, you failed and you did it intentionally because it wasn't the Republican president that you had planned on having. Period, end of sentence. Now, Sherrod Brown is the champion of a multitude of these policies that encourage inescapable government dependency and absolute socialization and government control. Hear me now when I say this. He is nothing more than a political pimp and pusher of hype, propaganda, and lies. And when given the opportunity to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Senator Brown on a debate stage, I will absolutely destroy him at a level that he has never felt in his entire adult life. Amen. He has been in office. Go ahead and talk on that. He has been in office since 1973. I was born in 1978. He's never worked a day in the private sector. He has never signed a paycheck. He has never had to deal with the IRS knocking at their door when they want to be paid or any of the compliance institutions or organizations that threaten to shut your business down if you're late. He has no idea what that looks like a day in his life. And I absolutely want him out of office. He is not a Democrat. He is a radical leftist. There is no other way to describe him. If you want to know where I stand on the Second Amendment, it's very, very simple. 
been a concealed card holder since 2009. I was also in the rental business, had to deal with cash transactions, had four sons, and when I was on the road and my husband was away for work, you better believe I was going to take up the right to bear arms against any threat that may have come my way, and everybody knew that I was packing everywhere that I went, intentionally. I'm only five foot two, I have heels on tonight. <laughs> I worked extremely hard, not just because I'm running for the United States Senate, but you will see me historically featured working on initiatives in the African American and minority communities as well as in the women communities at LEPD Firearms. I've been hosting concealed carry card holder classes for a very long time. That's not just because I started running for the US Senate, it's because I know that the Democrats will go and intentionally target those minority groups and those, those the women groups, and they want them to believe that the Second Amendment is at fault for everything that we see happening right now in the United States of America. You know and I know that there's no truth to it. More propaganda. If you want to know where I stand on the pro-life movement, it's very simple. Again, look at my history. I am friends with people like Alveda King and Father Frank Pavone of Priests for Life. I was filmed nationally in Titusville, Florida because I have been working to advance those initiatives. And I can go into any community that I want to that Sherrod Brown has politicized and I can tell them, I've got to tell you, how would Sherrod Brown care anything about you as a minority community or as women? when he champions organizations that disproportionately kill five times more African-American children than any other race with Hispanic coming in in a close second. That is nobody who cares about your community. The institutions that he champions made me meet with my state reps back in 2012 and 2013 when I owned a staffing company and I couldn't get my employees to increase their hours for fear of losing the multitude of entitlements that they were receiving. If you think it's not happening, I'm here to tell you it is. And the biggest disconnect and issue that I had with the reps that I was meeting with, it was like they had no idea what was going on. I said, You've never started a business, have you? You've never had to staff organizations like I have, have you? Many of them went to school, got their political science degree, ended up going into the legislature, and that's where they are right now, legislating on theory and concept from a book, and they have no idea what the real world practicality of their decisions does to the public. I am asking you right now to get behind me and to send somebody to go toe to toe with Sherrod Brown to shut him down. Learn from our mistakes of 2012, $84.5 million was spent between the Republicans and between the Democrats. Republicans outspent the Democrats six to one. We walked away with a loss. People need to understand this is not about big money anymore. This is about sending statesmen to Washington to legislate for our people. I have a child in Kuwait right now, and don't you dare tell me I'm only good enough to serve, have my boys serve this country, be willing to fight and die for it, but his mom can't go to Washington to fix the failed policies that I've had to live under for way too many years. It's not gonna happen anymore. Preservation of power is real. That's why you see the Ohio Republican Party getting involved and making endorsements during the primary for a career politician, a two-term Senate or congressman. That is who they are endorsing. That's who they're propping up, and that's who they're telling you you need to vote for. You have choices. You have options. We can create a world where our children can run, where incredible wealth is not the measure, and political connectivity is not what decides their fate of who gets to serve over us. God bless and keep each and every one of you. God bless the great state of Ohio. And most importantly, God bless America. Thank you.